perfect people. Great to see you. Welcome everybody online or campuses. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jared and I have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor of this wonderful folk known as Grace Community Church. If you're a guest, a special welcome to you. We're beginning a new, but you know what? Before we get into that, how about the last few weeks of our central pastors bringing the word to us? Isn't that great? So grateful for their teaching and preaching, and I got to listen to it here and then from afar, and my cup was filled, and I hope yours was as well. But I am thankful to be back. We're in a series called Just Be Perfect, where we're really playing on the reality that we cannot be perfect, but Christ was perfect on our behalf. And so through faith in him and what he's done, we receive his perfection, and now we are to live out what he's done for us through the, our potential and, and purpose in our lives. So let's get into it. Let me pray, and we'll do just that. Lord, thank you for all who have gathered, and I pray in the name of Jesus, you would open our hearts to the scriptures, open the scriptures to our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in an effort not to depress you too much, I thought I would instead begin with some questions. And here's a couple of questions to think about. What is going on in society right now that most upsets you? <laughs> what is going on in society right now that most scares you? I'm going to pretend like we didn't hear that, all right? Let's just keep going. Uh, what is going on in our society right now that most angers you? So with that understanding, my question would be this. How would God have you respond to it? How would God have you to live in it? Well, Jesus answers that question. So let's see what he says. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So if we were to take that in a simple sentence, here's what we could say that Jesus is saying to you and me in the society in which we live. is to live a good life to show our great God. Live a good life to show our great God. We are a Christian. You and I are to be noticeably different and also noticeably intentional and influential with the hope of Christ in a society that may scare you, threaten you. This is the answer of what Jesus calls us to. So we're in the Sermon on the Mount. We've been in the Sermon on the Mount for months. And so we're going back to this. We, we've kind of jumped ahead a section and came back to a section. So we're going to return to this. So all I'm doing in this series is I'm just following the words of Jesus again. We're just going to watch, walk right through it and what he's saying to them in that day and what he's saying to us. These words right now, salt and light, are coming off his teaching on the Beatitudes. We covered the Beatitudes, gosh, I think in the first of the year. So the Beatitudes, so a few are these. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God, poor in spirit, that we realize we need a Savior and his name is Jesus. And that even after you become a Christian, you are never not desperately dependent on him in your life. Uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who first mourn over their own sin. There's just sin and you hate it more and more because of what it could do in your life and how it separates you from God. You mourn over other people's sin, those you love, those who are, you have relationships with that you see what sin does in their lives. They self-destruct and disintegrate and you mourn. You mourn over our society. You mourn over the world and the sin's impact on this world. And so there's mourning, which you do as well. That's a beatitude. And then there's also the beatitude that we hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. 
Hungering and thirsting for righteousness first means you are made right with God through saving faith in Christ and what he did on the cross and his resurrection. So that rightness is there, and now you have the desire to live out that rightness in your life. And it's a pursuit for the rest of your life that you, 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 want, you want to experience more rightness, not in the sense of it makes you better with God because that's a done deal, but in the sense that it draws you closer to God and you can feel and experience more of him in your soul and through your life. So it's on the heels of that that Jesus says, that's how, you, that's how you relate to the world and how you relate to God. Now here's how you live in the world. Here's how you live in terms of being a Christian to live out these beatitudes, salt and light, salt and light. Now when Jesus says salt of the earth, light of the world, he's implying something about the world. So if he's saying be salt in the world, what, what does that mean? What is he implying about the world's status? He's saying, implying that the world is rotten, <laughs> that the world is decaying. So we ought to, you know something we ought to do today? When you get home, you ought to give your refrigerator just a big hug. <laughs> because we don't understand how salt really does that today. I know when my parents were growing up and in some third world countries that the only way you preserve meat is to pour salt on it and rub it in. It keeps it from decaying. It keeps it from rotting. I went to a Waffle House years ago. Anybody know a Waffle House up in here? What about there? What about you out there? Waffle House. Okay, we got some people. It's like a diner in the South, but better. <laughs> and so I remember I was at this one Waffle House that Birmingham, Alabama, they served me like a, a piece of steak with the eggs and so forth. And as soon as I cut it, lifted it up, I smelled it right then. That was a bad steak. That was a rotten steak. And I'd never get that smell out of my life. <laughs> And it's amazing, that's what Jesus says about the world, that it's a rotting world, it's a, a decaying world. I mean, on the way in this morning, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to turn on the news, and I'm just going to listen to it. Let's just kind of see if there's any positive news out there this morning. After all, it is Sunday. I, I, turned, I turned it right back off because there was murder and mayhem and crime and so forth. In other, in other words, the world is decaying. That's why he says you're the salt to be rubbed in the world. But then he says you're also the light of the world. Now, what does that imply about the world? It's dark. It's a dark world. There's darkness in the world. You know this. The scriptures teach this, that we are at the core depraved in our souls because we have a sin nature that has separated us, separated us from God. Now, we're not as bad as we can be, but we know what lurks within us. I mean, just let somebody r drive out in front of you going down the road and what, wants, what you want to come out of your mouth in that moment, that's all you need to know. Or be married for any amount of time and you can know what lurks in you because there's a darkness in the world and that's a darkness in humanity. I, when I first became a pastor, I served in the church as a student pastor in the 90s and I was teaching youth and I was teaching them the Bible, right out of the Bible. And I literally had a pastor on that staff say to me, don't give them so much Bible. And then he said this, because everybody's basically good, you just need to pull it out of them. Okay. I'm thinking everybody locked their car doors before they walked in here this morning and your house. And some of you have alarms that you turned on because the world is dark. And there are only two, I heard this years ago from another pastor, there are only two kinds of people, bad people and Jesus And we're not Jesus. <laughs> yeah, because there's, there's rot in the world. There's decay. There's darkness, he says. Now, think of this, though. But we live in a really wonderful world. I mean, we live in one of the best places in the country. Hudson Valley is about to be fall, and the, the, the leaves are going to turn. I love this time of year. And then look at the advancements in technology of our world, or even of our society, advancements. I read this week. For those of you who do any shopping at Whole Foods, that you can now pay for your groceries at Whole Foods by putting your palm under the scanner. Uh-uh. No. Thank you. But that's amazing. And not only that, but the breakthroughs such as in medicine and cures and science and and inventions, I came across an invention yesterday poking around online. 
You can literally buy a UV light wand. It's about that tall, about that thin. You can almost carry it in your pocket or in your, your, your purse. And you, it's 60 bucks. You could turn it on. No matter where you are, you can pull it out, turn it on, and roll it over your hands and over the table or desk in which you sit, which you sit and it kills the germs. That's amazing. But you know what? All this progress and advancement, it is not progressed or advanced the human heart. The human heart is still diseased. It's still, as Jeremiah says, sick and depraved. So we need help. And for the Christians who find hope for their heart, we live in a decaying, dark world that can anger, that can threaten, that can scare, that, that can frustrate. But you know, as Jesus implies how rotten and dark the world is, do you know what God says about the world? He so loved the world. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. God loves a decaying, dark world so much that he came in himself through Christ to bring light to the world in which Jesus came. And now through Christ and faith, we are made just that salt and light in the world, to live a good life in the world, to show our great God to the world. So let's go through this. There's salt here that Jesus talks about. Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. Notice Jesus didn't say this. You are the sugar of the earth. Just be kind and sweet. And I mean, there's a place for that, but that's not what he says. He also doesn't say you are the vinegar of the earth. I mean, we're not to be sour and smelly. No, he says you are the salt of the earth. Why did Jesus pick salt? Because salt was deeply valued in Jesus's day. Roman soldiers were often paid with salt. There's a Latin word around salt that may sound familiar. It's called salarium. Sound familiar? It's where we get the word salary. You know what salarium means? Salt money. Ever heard anybody say, well, he's not worth his salt? Well, that comes back from, from all these, from this history of this word. So salt in that day very precious, very valuable. So Jesus says, you, born-again believer, you are precious and you are valuable, but it's not for you just to revel in and come to church with. No, you are a salt of the earth. You're to be like salt. So what does salt do? Let's look at a few things. First of all, salt preserves. Preserves how? That it goes into meat to preserve the meat from rotting. It goes in, it absorbs water, it dries out the meat, it removes bacteria. So Jesus says he has made you salt to be in a decaying world, to stem the tide of rot through the way you treat people, through the way you're, you're married, through the way you show compassion to people, how your integrity, your behavior, you are just naturally a salt preservative in the world to be rubbed in. But salt is also, secondly, it's separate. Salt is blended into the food. It does not become the food. Are you with me? So when Jesus talks about in John 17 that you are in the world, but he says, don't take them out of the world, but we're to remain not of the world. We're to remain salt. Salt is still distinct when it goes into the food. It's still salt. It's rubbed within where you can't see it anymore, but it's not the food. So Jesus implies this for our lives as well. And salt doesn't bring attention to itself either. Salt brings out the glory of something in the sense. So I, I got two words for you. McDonald's fries. <laughs> now, come on. Even for the health conscious among us, that's just a jubilee of potatoes. <laughs> we know how glorious McDonald's fries are. But here's what I tell you to do. Today on the way home, once you swing through McDonald's and ask for fries without salt, they will be terrible. You will throw them out because McDonald's fries are only made glorious by the salt. In the same way, we're to be the salt. We're to preserve, but we're to remain separate and bring glory through, to Christ through our living our lives, remaining separate, but being an impact. I mean, think about salt being separate. What good is it if they speak profanity and we speak profanity? 
What good is it if they lie and we lie? That makes no difference in the world. So we say, no, you're to be separate but distinct in the, in the food. Also, salt seasons. Salt brings out flavor. Kind of talked about that a bit with the fries. But seasons to bring out flavor. So Christians, we ought to live a life in such a way that people look at us Instead of seeing that we're killjoys, because many people think Christianity is just so suppressive and it's a joy killer in your life and you're, you're, you're not, you can't really live out who you are and be happy and all of that. And we ought to show that's exactly what God does in our lives. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's joy. That this, that's cosmic joy that this world can't understand. An abundance within us of this joy and this life he's given us. Peter Kraft, who's a, who's a philosopher, he said this. He said, the opposite of pleasure is not pain. The opposite of pleasure is boredom. We live in a bored world, y'all. Just look at the, as Paul says, the inventions of evil. People trying to keep going to the ultimate pleasure that will never be found. G.K. Chesterton, one of my favorite philosophers, one of my favorite dead people, you could say, philosophers, here's the way he put it. He said, meaninglessness does not come because one's weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes because one is weary of pleasure. So we as Christians are to be in the, the mix of the food, if you will, on the plate, showing, no, that Christianity is life. It is abundance. It is joy in Christ, something that suffering cannot ultimately touch, something that meaninglessness will never touch in our lives because of who we are. And when you think about salt, think, think about salt in such a way. So I brought my lab today. I'm glad you're, you know, you're glad to see it again. So just th think about salt. Salt is to be, imagine if I had some fries or you had some fries in front of me, who, who's going to take the top off and dump it? No, you don't do salt like that, right? You take salt and you sprinkle, you sprinkle. And that's what Jesus says you are. You don't pour salt out in the sense that as Christians, we're not to be obnoxious, we're not to be judgmental, pouring the salt, so to speak. No, we're just to be a little sprinkle or as the recipe says, a little pinch. I don't cook much, but I always marvel that when I try to do something in the kitchen and make something, there's this dish and the recipe says, just a pinch of salt. And I look at this dish and go, what's a pinch of salt going to do? It needs a lot of pinches of salt to bring out the flavor. But no, just a pinch, just a pinch. You know what? That's all God calls you to be, just a pinch. We tend to overwhelm ourselves and put so much pressure on ourselves as Christians to think we got to be loud and bombastic and make a huge difference. Jesus says, listen, settle down, Christian. On your little plate, just be a little pinch, a little pinch of salt. Little pinch of salt that'll bring out the flavor to be a seasoning, if you will, and a preservative there in that place. And think of it just a pinch. How many of you are in a, in a situation right now or in a place of life right now where you have no Christians around you? That's tough. You're in a workplace, you don't have any Christians or barely any Christians or somebody who calls himself a Christian but don't, doesn't really live like it or believe like it. Maybe in your school, on the team, in the dorm room, maybe even in your own family. Well, Jesus says, you, you don't pour the salt on You just be the little pinch of salt where he has you right there. You're the only one, so be it. Be the little pinch of salt in that place. Stay separate, distinct, preserve, season. When you get past the Beatitudes to this salt and light, the last beatitude is this. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So that's how he ends the beatitudes. And right after he says, you will be persecuted for righteousness' sake, I meaning you'll be persecuted because you're a born-again believer made right with God through faith, and for righteousness' sake because you live a right life. Integrity, character. So that means... If you're going to be persecuted for righteousness' sake, it means that you're going to be salt that also stings. It's going to sting. It's going to bring persecution because back in the day when there were wounds and little medicine to go around, they would pour salt in the wound to kill the germs and the bacteria there. So you might sting. And how sting how? Because you might 
speak up if there's maybe a racist comment that's happened or a joke of some sort. You don't, you don't join in in the coarse joking or in the profanity. You stand for your morals or you take a quiet, salt-like stand of something unpopular that's when you, that everybody celebrates around you, or you refuse to attend an event or a ceremony of something of some sort because it goes against your Christian conscience. That's going to sting others, so even sting you a bit, perhaps, because it's tough to make that call, but it's what the Lord calls you and I to do. Jude chapter 3 says to defend the faith once and, all delivered to, once and for all delivered to the saints, so that will require you to stay strong in faith. Also, doctrine and worldview that we spent a lot of time on this last few months. When you take these kinds of stands when it comes to gender and sexuality and abortion and whatever else is out there that Christians can, just by virtue of being a Christian, can bring a lot of stinging around you. Well, that's why Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. So don't be surprised. Jesus would imply here. Watch this, Matthew 5, 13. But if salt lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So this doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It just means that you and I could be rubbed into the world and become a part of the world, which is what salt shouldn't do or salt isn't. So you can put, salt can be diluted by pouring it into a, a lot of water. It dilutes the salt. Or you mix salt with sand that you pour on the driveway on the ice. The salt becomes diluted. It's not fully salt. So Jesus is implying in the same way you can, be, you can become diluted in your, in your faith or, or diluted in being a Christian influence or corrupted by the world, by believing what the world believes and behaves like the world behaves in your life and become corrupted in that kind of way. There are many things in Scripture that call us apart from the world. James 4.4 4 says, to be a friend with the world makes one an enemy with God. James 1.27 says, don't be corrupted by the world. Matthew 13.22, Jesus says that the worries of, the, of your life and the lure of riches can dilute and corrupt your life. So what is the world then? The Apostle John puts it this way, do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Here it comes. Here's the world. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So are you being diluted and corrupted by the world? Craving for physical pleasure. Pleasure is your aim. You always have to be comfortable. Everything always has to be convenient. Or you have secret sin in your life. Or you keep turning to something not of God in your life for the pleasure of it. When Jesus says we are to deny ourselves for a greater pleasure, and that's the experience of God himself in Christ. Also, a craving for everything we see. Do you tend to find yourself comparing yourself to someone else's body or to someone else's achievements or to someone else's trinkets? And feel that you're lower on the totem pole unless you have these things to make something of your life. And then he says, the pride in our achievements and possessions. Nothing against achievements and possessions. It's finding pride in it. Meet your meaning in it. Your value and worth in it. All of that, Jesus says, is of the world. And it can dilute you and corrupt you. Meaning, you're just living the way the world lives. There's no difference. There's no distinction. So he calls us to something better, the potential for which he made you and saved you, the meaning in which you long to have is found in being salt. So here's my question to you. You ready for this one? Are you worth your salt in the world? Where are you rationalizing with sin or compromising sin in your life? Where have you shifted in the, the biblical views upon the world in all kinds of ways? Have you been more of a, pul a, a, a salt pourer instead of a salt pinch? Meaning, what's, what's your salt? Is it, is it mostly the pouring out of your politics and opinions? When that too is being a part of the world, becoming the world. When the salt is, you pull back and say, no, that's not ultimately what Christ calls me to be in this society. 
He's called me to chiefly be salt, preserve, season. Salt, are you worth your salt? Then Jesus gets into light, light. To live, to live a good life, to show our good God comes through being salt and light. Matthew 5, 14, Jesus says, <clears throat> you are the light of the world. He doesn't say you are the hammer of the world. You're the light, the light. Why light? The darkness, as we've talked about. John 3, 19, Jesus puts it this way. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. I think we see that glaringly today. The, the wanting to remain in the darkness and even call darkness truth, even call darkness light because their deeds were evil. But again, what is, how does God feel? How does Jesus feel about a dark world? Loves this world. Loves you. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world, Jesus says. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That is what Christ is, who he came to be. And now he says, when you place your faith in him, you are the light. He doesn't say you go be a light. He doesn't say you are a light. He says you are the light, meaning we are his light in this world in which to live our life. So what does light do? What would light look like in your life and mine? First, light dispels the darkness. No one goes to bed afraid of the light. It's always the dark. So, so you are two Christians, wherever you are, from home to school to team to dorm room, with your presence there, there ought to be a sense of safety because you're there, a sense of security because a Christian's here. Also, light illuminates. You, you can see in the dark a bit. I mean, unless there's just something completely blacked out, you can see in the dark. But what you see in the dark is a distorted reality. You, you don't see something for what it is. You only see shapes, very vague kind of shapes. So a dark world brings a distorted reality. So Christians who hold on to the book of reality live out what true reality looks like. Light shows things as they really are. We show who God really is through our light. Also, we show... God's love for the world through our light. Also, meaning. We show the meaning we have in Christ, the purpose he's given us in this, in this life, in our world, as a light that illuminates, that illuminates. We know that through the light, you can, you can navigate your surroundings. So if you're in the dark, even if you can see a little bit, it's really difficult. You trip over things, you knock into things, it's really difficult to navigate yourself. So to be the, have the light of Christ, we see what's right and wrong. We see how to live and not to live. We see how to treat people and not treat people. So in the same way, the light comes on and we are the light. We, show, we help people navigate around distorted reality. We illuminate. But we gotta understand as we do that, there can be a bit of a negative side to the light in that light exposes. Light exposes. So in darkness, dark areas get exposed. And those who have it hate that. I mean, even as a Christian, when dark areas creep into my life, I don't like when they come to light in me. Or Christy, God uses Christy to bring those to light in me. I don't like that at all. And I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. So imagine a world that doesn't want their darkness exposed. They say to you, no, don't call my darkness darkness. Call my darkness light. And if you don't, you've exposed it. And now persecution could be a possibility. John 3, Jesus says, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. Another verse here I don't have on the screen, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So that's tough words, but we're to be a light. Even that brings an exposure and the kickback from it, and that comes with the light as well. Light also heals. Do you know there's red light, uh, like a little pen? If you have inflammation, you can take that red light, and so if you have swelling in your wrist, you just roll that red light over it for a few minutes, and it helps take out the, the swelling. That's amazing. Then you have sunlight. We're supposed to be 20 minutes in the sunlight because sunlight brings, helps bring healing. It helps our brains and our minds. So light brings healing. So Christians ought to have a healing kind of influence, healing words, healing 
a healing touch, a healing involvement in the community or in the, or in the meeting or you join the group or wherever God has you in, in the little plate, but also in the little dark corner in which he has you as well. Also, light finally guides. It guides. Light shows the way out of darkness. People ought to look at your life and mine and see a way out of whatever darkness they find themselves in because Jesus ultimately is the way out. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the way out of darkness. And because we reflect his light, like the moon to the sun, we're not the light, we reflect it, we're showing where we get the light from. And his name is Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. So a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Does it say it should not be hidden? No, it means you are the light. There's no should not to it. You just are the light. That's the glory of this truth. Now, it just, now just go be what he's made you to be. So if, if, a, if a city did not want attention because of the dangers and the threats it faced, it would never build on a hill. It would build more toward the valley. So Jesus, looking around, a great rabbi would always pick things out and teach using them as analogies. He said, look at that city over there. It's on the hill. It cannot, it cannot be hidden So in the same way, Jesus says, don't be threatened by society. Don't keep your head down. No, you are to be a light that all can see. If you're a true Christian, you cannot escape notice because of the light you carry. You will stand out and it will invite the good and the negative in your life. But that's what being a light means. Then he goes on to say, no one lights a lamp, puts it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. So a Roman oil lamp, this is kind of what it looked like in Jesus' day. This is a, it's a, it's a, you can tell it's flat, kind of like a, the genie, Aladdin, and it would sit on a, on a stand in the middle of the room. So a Roman house, he talks about a house, it was typically only one room. So they would take this little lamp about this big, and they would put it on a stand in the room and light it, and it would give light to the to the room. Notice this isn't a spotlight. It's not a blinding light. It's just a small little pinch of light. It has a purpose. It's long standing. It's persevering and it brings light. Sounds like what we're called to be Christians, right? We're to be lifted up or, or lifting up Christ with our little pinch of light where we are to be persevering with as light for him to bring just a little bit of light at where we are. Then he says, Those who are light don't put it under a basket, but on a stand, as we talked about, and it will give light to all the house. So if the light sitting there, no one would take, and it was usually eight gallons, an eight-gallon kind of basket or bushel is what it's called in in another translation. He said, how foolish would would it be to put it there? So I don't have a bushel, but I got this. So how foolish would it be to put this out and then throw a cover over it? Now, it's not going to set the cover on fire. It It will suffocate the light. It'll knock the light out. Oh, so I got a question for you. If you and I are called to be these lamps for Jesus and we can hide it or suffocate it, what's going on in your life in which you are suffocating the light you are? What's going on? What's, what's happened? What, what are you involved in? What, what are you going through? And I'm going to tell you things like being vocal about politics, being vocal about your opinions, being vocal about society. All of those things may have a place individually at moments, but in the end, Jesus takes all the pressure off that we don't have to be everything. We're just to be lamps and light and not use things of the world and society and our own opinions and to throw it over the lamp, to get involved in everything the society's worked up about. We're just playing. We're, we're now part of the lights, we're now the, the, the part of the food. And so Jesus is saying, no, be separate, be distinct. Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That word good also means beautiful and attractive. So for Christians, you and I, we're to have a, an attraction about our lives, something that woos people to us. Then he says, your light before others. Notice he doesn't say your light before each other, before other Christians, 
but before others in the darkness and the decay from which we are with our, wherever we're living in our little plate or our little corner of the world. So here's a question I have for you. Because I think if Christians, one of the things we get right and wrong is that we can do more exposing or unintentional or intentional offending where it turns people away from the light. So I'm going to set that aside and just ask you this instead. When's the last time someone was drawn to your light? When's the last time someone reached out because they saw joy, they felt safe, secure to come to you? When's the last time that's happened in your life? And if it's not happened or it's been a while, then this is a great time to be together to say, no, well, I must not be fully what Christ has called me to be. And this is a new day to begin living out exactly what Jesus has made you and I to be. Now, what could that be? Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you know that tomorrow morning when you wake up, God's got a list of good stuff for you to do to attract people to him? Think about that. So tomorrow morning when you wake up, believer, maybe you get on your knees first and say, Lord, what's your list for me today? What, what's, the, what's the attractive work you would have me to do today? I just don't want to go to work and clock in and clock out and try not to sin and come home and try to be there for my wife or husband and my kids and then go to bed and get up and do it all again tomorrow. No, do you see the meaning and the purpose you have right now? It's cosmic, salt, light, a list every day that God's already prepared in advance for you to do. He's made it so easy for us. So will you wake up tomorrow and ask that question? There are different ways I thought. I just jotted these down. Going out of your way to serve someone that you see that others may think are awkward or, or weird or they may take advantage of you. Maybe that's part of the list God's given you for the day. Or maybe you're the first to help someone in need or... You know, I told one of my kids who's a senior this year, I said, when you go to school, because they were telling me about when they were freshmen and how terrified they were. I said, you know what? If you have any freshmen in your school that you know or you come across and you see them terrified, just go up to them and say, I got your back. If you need anything, let me know. I'm here for you. Let me know if I can help you do your class. Look around the lunchroom, anybody sitting by themselves. Don't let anybody sit by themselves. Can I say that to all of us? Don't let anybody sit by themselves. I mean, now there's some people who are like, get away from me. And I get that. That would be me. All right. But you know, you know when someone's lonely. Gosh, let us be light to the least, the last, to the lost, the lonely. Light, light. Live a good light. Be a good light. Be a good light to show a good God to the world. So how will you be practically salt and light this week? And you know, it's, it's, it's as simple as this in our day. Perhaps just, fellas, love your wife. Ladies, respect your husband. Kids, honor your parents. And if you go out to eat, tip well. <laughs> it's just start simple with the very plate or corner in which God has given you and me and how we are to live. So let me wrap it up here. Salt. This salt is no good until it is poured out. And what I think happens is a lot of people come to the salt shaker every Sunday. I see a lot of salt in here, but we're all in the salt shaker. So when you go out this week, are you going to stay in your salt shaker? Or are you going to say, God, let me be a pinch of salt. Let me be a dash of salt this week. So that's my call to you, church. Believers in Christ, wherever you are, don't just do Sundays and be a Christian and go through the week and try not to cuss as much. No, be salt this week. And where, God, where you have me seasoned this week, where you have me to, de- to, to stem the decay with my words, with my relationships, and <clears throat> be a light. Be a light. I'm going to see if I can get this to work. Oh, it's not cooperating with me. Hold up. Come on. Everybody look that way for a minute, all right? <laughs> all right, so I don't know if it's going to cooperate. This will be the most anticlimactic ending ever if it doesn't, but I'm going to try my best. 
Come on, light. All right, all right. All right. All right, I better stop before I mess it up. So, God's called us to be a lamp, right? This isn't a, this isn't huge, but he's just called us to be a lamp right where we are. Now, if you're a Christian, we're all in light together, right? So you can't see this in the light. Some Christians say, if I, I would do better if I, if I was, if I worked for a Christian ball. So I worked in a Christian place Well, you're just working in the light. Or you just come to church and this is it. You're just in the light. No, no one can see light. No one can see the lamp in the light, but you darken it. And now, can you see that? And look, that's not a spotlight, is it? It's not a blinding, glaring, overwhelming light. It's just a little light. It's just a pinch, a little dash of light. So if you're in a place, uh, the school, the dorm, the workplace, the office, and it's just, there's no Christians hardly there. Praise God. Be the light, just a little pinch of light right there that God's made you to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Glory for this glorious call in our lives when you say you are the salt, you are the light, meaning we are your plan A and there is no plan B for a decaying, dark world. Lord, I look over this room and I think of those online at our campuses. I see plan A's everywhere, salt and light everywhere. So much potential, so much meaning, so much hope. And I pray, God, help our unbelief to go out of these doors, out of the salt shaker, out of being under lights to be your salt, just a pinch where you have us and a little dash of light in our own dark corner. Yes, thank you for the work you're gonna do through these lives this week and through mine. To you be the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, we all said, amen, amen. amen. Thank you.